Hey everyone, and welcome to the Agent 251 Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Will. This interview is a little bit different. It was recorded live in the office of Jill Biggs. She is one of the top real estate agents in the state of New Jersey, one of the top real estate agents for Cowell Banker. And she's been recognized by Real Trends the last few years as having one of the top producing real estate teams in the country. So I have been scouring the country looking for the top agents you know, out there in the business today to share their secrets, to really pull back the curtain and let us know, how do you become one of the top agents and one of the top agent team owners in the country? And Jill Biggs was at the top of my list. She is personally coached by Tom Ferry himself, and she's going to talk about that in the interview. This is a little bit different than our regular interviews. We, I wanted you to experience Jill Biggs in her raw true self. I didn't want to censor her. So there will be some explicit language, but that is who Jill Biggs is. And uh, this is a no holds barred interview with one of the top realtors in the country. So I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Agent 251 podcast, the real estate show that looks deep into the work and culture at JWRE, Jason Will Real Estate in Mobile and Baldwin counties. Jason, Agent 251, investigates and spills the beans on his case closing clues and industry secrets for motivating agents while educating buyers and sellers. There, like within my own team, I have almost no turnover. Like people come and then they don't really go elsewhere. And that is not, it's not money. It has to do with the fact that we're nice. So some of what keeps the people in my group is that when you start here, besides the fact that we have lots of resources and training, which when you start, I mean, you're running a brokerage and brokers, in, including my own or, or the big guys, they offer all these different training packages, right? But you're kind of on your own and no matter what, it doesn't matter. You can go and ask your broker questions, but he's, he's not really out there doing it. So you're getting whatever it is that he says, and then you kind of have to come up with your own leads and, um, and generate your own business. So for us, when we take people and we're super selective, we, uh, we put them through a 90 day onboarding program and we operate off of a Google calendar. So everybody can loop in and see where you are and they're mandatory. They go on people's appointments. So like when I go on a listing appointment, I never go alone. I'm always taking somebody junior with me and their job is to shut the fuck up and mm -hmm. listen. But the idea is that some of them will make it and can be listing agents because I don't need to take every listing and I'm not equipped to do that much. So we're kind of, after you get to a certain point in your business, you graduate and, um, which is what my appointment today, I'm taking somebody with me. Um, what, what if somebody th that you're taking with you, what, what if that developer uh, or potential seller looks to them and says, what's your input? And you, they know they're supposed to be so, quiet. Well, so the appointment that I'm going on today, the person that I'm taking with me is my team lead okay. in Jersey City. So. And it's a pitch on a building in Jersey City. So he is fairly up on what's going on. I, I would never take somebody who couldn't, you know. But my regular appointments, which, um, you know, last month, actually, uh, Tom Ferry, who's my coach, had me, uh, we broke down my numbers and he said, in order for me to make my numbers, I needed to take 36 listings. <laughs> so, um, in one month. So I, I stood in this room calling people and, um, it got to like the last day and we were at 30 <laughs> and, uh, I actually was calling people up. I called the developer I know. And I was like, do you have anything that I can sell? And he's like, no, I'm like, well, aren't you building anything? He's like, yes, but it's like six months out. We just broke ground. And I said, do you have the floor plans? And he said, yes. I said, well, what are we thinking of pricing that at? And he's like, seven fifty dollars each. And I said, can I have those listings today? I'm going to sell them before before you're done. And he said, yes. So then I got two. And then I went down the hall and I got one of the guys that works for me, um, who does tech and training to uh, get his mother. I knew she was going to list her house in a few months, but I convinced them that we should list that house now because the market is uh, tanking right? <laughs> and you could lose money. So it was like, it was so funny because everybody, we were scrambling and we only made it to 34 listings. It was a very interesting day. And I have like a great, a great team that, uh, they help each other. Forget me. 
the way we do the best is if I stay in this room and don't leave. Unfortunately, um, I come out and I, uh, my operations person put that do not disturb because if you start to talk to me, then I'll talk to you. And, uh, and it's a problem. When my door is open, I typically get like a line of people standing there. But, but some of our culture is, is that you go on an appointment, an appointment. And typically in the beginning with new realtors, you're like a tour guide. And it's very hard if you're not closing people. Otherwise, you just show a whole bunch of property to them and they eventually buy from somebody else. So our, our system here is, yes, you'll take people out for a couple, few times. And then after that, if nothing's happening, one of us will show up and close them so that you end up getting paid. So it, it, it means that you're not standing here for a year, not making a dime. And it's interesting because now I've gotten to a certain point where in order for me to grow, I have to stop doing quite as many things that I've been doing because um, interesting things so far this year for me has about three months ago, uh, Tom Ferry had me break down exactly what my deals cost. And, and I don't mean I, th- I used to think that I knew what a deal cost and I used to think that I knew what a lead cost. But if you take every single dime in your whole business and you attribute it, you know, percentage wise to the buyer or the seller, and then you break all that down to the transaction cost. I used to take my new people, if they got a listing lead or if somebody came to an open house or whatever it was, I would go with them on the appointment. I would get the appointment and I would give them half the money. And it was really nice and everybody was really happy, which is probably why nobody ever left. But I realized now that I don't make any money. Only they make money because the cost of my transactions are something like $3,100 for a listing, period. And so it just didn't doesn't make sense. So I've had to kind of make some shifts while not fracturing my group, um, you know, because you can't go from warm and fuzzy to business person. There's got to be some sort of balance in there. And I think that that's important. And so, you know, John David is warm and fuzzy, but he has like a whole family thing and he has a super nice family and he has a nice team. Tom has a nice team too and a nice team culture, but he's very numbers oriented and, um, and his whole team is, is similar to him. If I could get all of my group, I actually took them to look at Tom and them standing in that room because I have some of them prospect and now we've made it mandatory. It didn't used to be. It used to be that I suggested it, but at this point, the way that we give our leads out here, if uh, you have, I I stole this from Tom Tool, I think we have 10 shifts a week. If you don't do four of those shifts, you don't get any leads at all. We cut you off. So, um, and we have a door at the end of the hall. It's called the doghouse, and we put your face up there. So, and then you get taken off rotation. And we're trying. It's like a public shaming? It's like a public show. <laughs> you know, but we're East Coast, so everybody's kind of jaded. They don't really do the gung-ho, you know. But getting people to call, because if you call, you could see that by standing in here calling, as I got all of those those listings, it, it's life-altering. I mean, the truth is, is that there's lots of different business models. But you have to pick up the phone. Right. And, and that's, you know, that's the way that it is. And my way has worked and it's, um, you know, some of it is, it's unique to my market. Like, so up until I guess two years ago, 80% of my business was in one square mile and it's easy, right? If you, even though there's 65,000 people in Hoboken, if you drive up and down the streets, my signs are there, there. And my mailings, every time I sell anything for the past, whatever, 10, 15 years, I've been sending out these just sold cards. So it's like everybody knows me. And then I have the added benefit, um, which wasn't good for me when I was young, of having crazy hair. So people remember me and they're like, oh, that's that woman with the hair. And so at this point, at every day, at least somebody calls me and asks me to come over for a listing appointment. So without doing anything, it just, it, you know, it's like a snowball. And now I'm trying to take over the next town. So I put a second team in place there, and I thought that uh, that that would be super easy, and it's not. It's uh, it's actually been hard. I mean, I was already selling there, but you tend to do most of your business where you are, 
and getting and and so I took I took somebody from here who uh, who needed to grow right the great agent was one of my first real losses and I put him over there and tried to make him team lead in Jersey City because I thought you know he'd been on hundreds of listing appointments with me and when he pitches he sounds just like me we're like the same person he even tells my stories but he went to Jersey City for six months and. He didn't grow any team. He didn't hire anyone. Nothing happened. And I learned that not everybody can can grow a team. Like, people can be good agents. We're not all the same. And, um, and he came back and said, I don't have any desire to have a team. And I ended up not really being able to restructure to help him grow. So he, he's an individual agent, and he went off on his own. Oh, wow. And uh, that was, it made me heart sick. Lesson learned is do the best that you can, and when people outgrow you, they go, and what are you going to do, right? doesn't happen to me too often, but it was painful. So I don't know what the lesson is or what I'm trying to, or if you're going to show that to other people, but that was, you know. No, I think that's a good lesson. You know, we, we talked about that with, with, uh, with John David, about the, the pains of being a team owner. You know, teams are very hot right now. It's, the, it's all the rage. It's the hot topic. but it really is a hot mess in reality. I mean, people don't know what they're doing. They don't have their house in order before they start the team. They can't hold people accountable. There's no culture. They don't have any core values. They're not well, profitable. There's a bunch of issues. I think that, um, which, you know, a lot of the time, Coldwell Banker, my company, has had me speak on on when it's time to grow a team, you know, and how do you identify what that means. And I think that... If you don't have a full-time assistant in place, you can't have a buyer's agent because you have nothing to do with that buyer's agent. And you have people in offices that join together and think, this is great. We're going to be a team. But that's, that's not really a team. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So you have to get to a point where, where you have a full-time assistant and you and the full-time assistant can't manage what's going on. And you also, if you're going to get, if you're going to grow, because I think this is the other problem with teams, a lot of teams cherry pick all of the good leads, mm-hmm. right? They give all these other people all the shit. And, um, and then they stay and they learn and then they go off on their own because it's not fair. Yeah. So I call that the kiss of death. Yeah. We don't do that. So here, right. Provided you show up and you do what you're supposed to do. We do uh, ability and availability, right? So if you're here, you're doing well, and um, and you've closed enough. We just give them out in a round robin. The new people, though, have to still get a certain number of deals under their belt before we let them loose. On um, we we're pretty high end in general. In comparison, my average price is eight eighty. So mm. when I take these twenty one year olds and I hand them a $2 million buyer, I shame on me, right? So, so it's, they're not really equipped to do that. However, because for whatever reason, I, this, this year I've had, I don't know, 25 deals listings over, you know, 1.5 million. And so when you have listings like that, those are the buyers that you get. So I have so many of them that, but they're, they're savvy. And um, most of them are in finance and they're not buying from you unless you know what you're talking about. It's kind of, you know, the internet, Zillow, has leveled the playing field. And when you go on appointments with these people, they, they've already looked everything up. So you have to really, you know, be able to, well, you have to build rapport. And that means you have to be similar to them. So that's a little tricky. So we, we've tried to kind of divide people up age specific and do a little bit of that. But not in a way where nobody has an opportunity. Once you get to a point where you're selling, we're we're trying to to you know boost you up and um, and help you so that you're going to do well in our market. And I think maybe that's also part of why I don't lose a lot of people. I mean, we have Keller Williams here, and um, the person who has grown it is now has 300 agents, and that's a whole business model, right? If you have 300 agents doing one deal, that's a lot of deals. So I can't deal with that, and I have learned, and this is my first year, where we actually now have really minimum standards. So everybody gets a one-year free pass, and then after that, you have to do 24 deals. 
right? If you don't do 24 deals, you shouldn't be a realtor Mm -hmm. at all. You should do a different thing. And it's not like we're going to have a mass firing here. I said, I will sit down with you and we will use my database and I will help you get another job because I really wish, you know, I want you to do well. We all, everybody likes you. It's just, it's not going to work out. You know, if everybody's making money and you're not making money, And we've looked at every single way. And this is not just we just wait till the end. It's like, so we have a business plan at the beginning of the year. And we have quarterly meetings, right? And we have somebody who is keeping everybody accountable. If things aren't happening, and I know, you know, that we've tried everything and we're not going to be able to make it work for you, it's a waste of everybody's time and energy. And typically the people that do do the least need the most. So do you have a sales manager since you are in production? So, yeah. So I have um, an operations manager who's uh, on her one vacation, which is killing me. And right. You mentioned that yeah, earlier. Yeah. And then I have a transaction listing manager, who Isaac, who you met. And then I have a sales uh, tech and training manager who runs my ISAs and, um, and the lead flow and keeps everybody accountable. And reports back to my ops. So, and all of that's not perfect, let me tell you. I also have a marketing person who uh, is in-house. And I have a woman in the Philippines who is my OSA, who answers when my ISA is not here. And sets appointments and, you know, handles the weekends and all of that. And I have a service that answers all night long. So, 24 hours a day, we answer our leads immediately. And... I don't know. What else? So I've got systems in place. uh, I'm fascinated by the close. I think a lot of agents in our industry, like you said, can be, nothing happens unless you close. So, but I think that's an issue in our industry. A lot of people, they say, I don't want to be a pushy salesperson. Mm -hmm. And so I agree with them. Nobody likes anybody who is selling them anything. However, I'm always closing and I'm, I'm super, super, it's, it's the opposite, right? It's the passive aggressive comes out. I will say, for instance, I have a person right now, I have a $3 million listing that I am, it's killing me. So I had, I've shown it to my own personal buyer four times, right? And I know I'm getting an offer on it today from somebody else's. And so I'm taking them and I'm like, low pressure. You don't have to, if this is not the house for you, don't buy it. However, it's really going to suck for you when the guy brings the offer in in two days. So if you're going to bring an offer, now's your opportunity. That's a close, right? It's like there's closes, all those little, the, the young people in here, right? You go in the kitchen, you're standing at the island and you're like, God, imagine the parties that you could have around this island. That's a close. Like all of these things that are low pressure are still closing. If you're not, if you're taking people out and, you know, at the beginning of, of learning. And for me, when I have a buyer, I explain to them in the beginning, we're going to look at six properties today. After we leave every single one of those properties, I'm going to ask you, did you like it better or worse than the one before? We're going to put them in order. So at the end, we're going to know what what our favorite three are. And otherwise, it's like going out and smelling too many perfumes. So I've already set them up. And then when I get to the end of the appointment, I'm able to say, so, you know, these were your top three and your top one being this. Do you want to buy that? Literally, that's not pushy. That's me not wasting my time because I refuse to. And the new people can't really do that because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. They're afraid you're not going to like them. And if you do it the wrong way, they're not going to like you. So there's like a fine balance because I have I have two Brazilians. And this is not racial, but they're in my group. And Brazilians by nature or they're just a little pushy. They're a little more aggressive. And I listen to them. And sometimes I know that's just too much for our culture. It's not going to work. And so we try to work through how, how is it? You, the whole matching and mirroring and all of that is so important, you know, to figure out who it is that you're working with beforehand, because there's some cultures that if you're not incredibly direct, you're never going anywhere, right? And there's some others that you have to kind of, you know, be a little bit more complacent. And I think that we also have role play partners, right? So right now we're practicing. 
I actually at 8.30 in the morning, I was on the phone going over the buyer script with, with one of the girls in my group. And it started out ring, ring, ring. And she's like, she got through the, I, I said, hello. And she said what she said. And I said, well, you lost me there. You sounded like a salesperson. I would have hung up. We're trying all the time to get ourselves to be better. And I, and I think part of it, in the beginning when you start, you really don't know anything. You need to follow people in your group around and just go on their appointments. So when I take people on an appointment, I always have somebody with me and I say to my, my buyers, this is whatever, they're new in my group. They're just learning the inventory. That's it. And they just follow along and listen. Because if you do that enough times, and everyone sells differently, and, and we are not in sales, right? We're in service, but we're still in sales, okay? We're still, we still have to get paid. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. And, and you know what? It's hard to know who's going to work out, who's not going to work out. Like, I used to hire my friends. Some of my friends still work here. At this point, I'm actually not in charge of hiring because I am the queen of hiring my friends. And, right. And my friends don't, don't do shit. So, <laughs> so uh, however, it was really nice, and we have a really good time together. And uh, I took all these, these women that had been stay-at-home moms for 18 years, and I thought, you should be a realtor. But at this point, I'm trying not to do that. So we actually run ads. And when you inquire, first you get to talk to Josh, who's the sales manager. If you make it through Josh, he sends you over a disc profile. And then that comes back and Lauren looks at it. And if you make it past that, Lauren interviews you. And Lauren used to uh, work in corporate America and human resources. And if you make it past Lauren, you're, you're virtually hired, right? Then you get to meet me. And I can, if I don't like you, whatever. And typically, if Lauren and I have any sort of misgiving, even a mild, because every time we have thought the person's okay and they sound like they're okay, but both of us know there's just something. What, what, that, that, and we hire them, we're, we, we're, it doesn't work out well. I mean, and we've made a mistake. So we really try to, um, to do everything possible, but you still make mistakes. You still sometimes have people and all you need is one bad person or bad. There's no bad, but, um, like a Debbie Downer or like, I refuse to be depressed. And I, when I used to hire people, one time they got me an assistant. It was like, I went through a string of assistants. I had this assistant. It was like day one and she's sitting next to me in, in the space with me and she starts vaping. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, right. And I'm, I'm chill. Okay, I have teenagers. I'm such a, you know, and I'm a drinker and I'm a partier. And I'm like, what the fuck, man? I, I, so I, I go over to Lauren and I'm like, I'm going down to the bar. You got to fire her. Okay, you're human resources. So it's like, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's, it is pretty, it's pretty funny. You know, the things that set us apart. We do really have a nice group and everyone helps everybody else. And so we don't have like fighting here over money. And we have crossover sometimes. Sometimes, um, cause you know, buyers are liars. They come in and they'll come in with different email addresses, mm -hmm. you know, and we do everything to try not to have that happen. But we're, we're nice to each other and we try to like work it out and so that everybody feels like it was fair and they didn't get screwed. And everybody here is, is willing to help each other. And I think that we do a lot of competitions, which always cost me money, but we do things together as a team, at least once a month. I think last month we went drunk bowling and then karaokeing in the city and we divide up and everybody's so competitive that it's, uh, it's pretty funny. And we do nice things, you know, for the community. We try to be super involved. Everyone in my group is uh, required to join a different uh, committee. So when I started yeah. uh, originally, and it was only a few of us, I implemented that. And one of the girls is like head of CCD, which uh, is the church. And then we had the Gay Runners Club. We have like a, somebody who's in a, uh, a BNI group that they go to. We have somebody who belongs to Jersey City's urban something something we have somebody who no no politics whatsoever we are um 
regardless of what your opinions are. We try not to put them out there anyway. But we, we absolutely have somebody in every single school. Because part of my whole thing was I started real estate. Um, it was an accident. I had, uh, years ago, I was a New York City nightclub bartender. And I ended up getting pregnant, right? And then I had this baby, and I brought the baby to the bar at like three days old. And my uh, ex-husband uh, was not really equipped to deal with that, so I had to do something different. So he he was very entrepreneurial. And so he gave me some money, and he said, go and open a business. And you know I didn't know anything about anything because I was a bartender. So I opened up this children's clothing and toy store because I thought that I have a baby, and I could bring the baby to work, and wouldn't that be great? So I did that, and of course I never could bring the baby to work because it really didn't work that way. But I did it for 10 years in Hoboken, and then I went to Maui. We had decided we were going to go somewhere beautiful and surf, and I sold my business. And I lasted about a year there because I'm a workaholic and can't really go to the beach for a year. But I came back here, and I had no job, but I had this big database of women with money that had been shopping in my store. So I had a friend who uh, had come to stay in my house, and my ex-husband thought he would never move out. So I sent him to real estate school, and he became a realtor, and he was doing it for it for like three months, and he was having a really good time. And I thought, I could be a realtor. So I became a realtor, and, um, and I used my database, and I marketed to these women. And they had loved me because they trusted me with their children and their clothing. And so they gave me their buildings, and... and I kind of hit the ground running and it was, it was great. I mean, and so I had four kids. I sent them to four different private schools, right? I have been in every single school here and I joined every organization. And so that whole thing has, uh, helps you, right? It's all about influence and all about who you know, especially when you have money, right? The higher end, the property, you have to kind of get out there. And so everyone else in my group, has a, a lot of us have kids in different schools. And so we tend to support every single kid's organization, which is, which is good and bad, right? It costs me a lot of money, but we're literally everywhere. I mean, you know, my parking spot, I have a parking spot. I bid on it in an auction at the church around the corner. They auction it off for money and I'm a Jew, but I'm happy to be whatever you want me to be just so I can park. Anyway, so we support everything. We're also uh, culture, right? Our culture is we never do anything wrong to anybody. I don't, I don't even care. My, my own kid, her first deal, and she's been with me for maybe a year. So she, she takes some young person out, and, uh, and she comes back, and she's super excited. She's, she's made a deal. She sold him a property. And I'm looking it over, what it is, and I pick up the phone. I call the guy on the phone, and I said, do not buy this property. And my kid is like, what's wrong? I'm like, this is a bad deal. It's a bad deal. The taxes are bad. Um, you're you, like, I, I'm like, you, you'll buy something else. So I kill her deal for her. And she's angry because she's angry. And I said to her, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? In the end, we never sell anything that's going to come back to haunt us. Because in urban America, every three and a half to five years, I get the same people back. And God forbid I sold you a lemon or you've been screwed over. What am I going to say to you then when I can't resell your property? And people talk. All it takes is like one horrible incident to, you know, you don't, you don't want people to say things like that. Which leads me, right, my whole spiel on online leads at this point, right? We're a review-based society. And, you know, when you go out and you want to go to a new restaurant, you go on Yelp. You look it up, and um, if people are saying a lot of negative shit about that restaurant, you don't eat there. So the same thing goes with realtors. When you go on uh, there, and you, they, they're looking you up. So if you don't have a bunch of reviews, and if you know, or if they're negative, everybody knows that, and they're hiring that way because because that's how the direction is. And and for me, when I go on a listing appointment, I typically will. Look up, I'll, well, first I'll ask, am I competing? Nine out of ten times they'll tell me, and I'll ask who I'm competing against. And then I'll go on to Zillow, I will look that realtor up, and I will print out their reviews. And I bring it with me. And believe me, if those people don't have 
a platform and they don't have reviews and a profile like, like I do, who do you think is getting a listing, right? So all of those things are important. And I think that that has served us well. At this point, we last year we did 340 deals. And this year, you know, my goal is 667. Now, if I have to stand in this room and get uh, this month, I'm supposed to get 40 listings. That's a lot. So I have to target some buildings because yes, it's going to kill me. And then the other thing, it's, it's so funny, as growth teaches you this. So I went after all those, those listings and I got 34 of them. And I have no idea what's going on, right? That, what happens when you do that? I'm not equipped because I have listings now, like I have the pictures, but I haven't called the people back, right? It, we, we have all of this shit going on and you can't keep up with it. So it's like, then your, your systems fracture. So now we have to figure that out. And I think it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a growing experience. And I started out talking, right? I'm a good rambler, aren't I? Great. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's good. I love it. Well, I have your coach by Tom Ferry himself. Yeah. Did you start out that way, get, getting coached by no. Tom? I, I started in about 2010. I was doing, I don't know, 50 deals. And I decided I needed help. So I started looking at different coaching systems, and I went and I looked at Brian Buffini, and I looked at Mike Ferry, and I looked at Core, I think. And then I went and I watched Tom, and um, I don't know, he his, uh, whatever happened, I liked what he said. So um, it took me a few times, because I'm kind of a hard sell, and uh, eventually I jumped in and I signed up. And then, back then, there were a couple hundred people, and... I interviewed a few coaches, which you couldn't do at this point, to see who was a good fit for me. And I ended up with a guy named Dean Ayers, who was my yeah, first, no, Dean. Yeah. He was my first coach ever. And I got so much from him. I stayed with him for about a year. And at, at some point after a year, I decided that I had gotten, that he was my friend. Right. You know? And, um, and I loved him and I still love him. Like when I go to those places, I hang out with him. He's a, he's a good friend. So, but, but I had snowed him, right. And he, he knew who I was. And so it wasn't like the level of putting me out of my comfort zone was gone. Right. Cause I wasn't, I was comfortable. And then I, uh, I changed and, um, and I coached for a bit with Debbie Holloway and, then after her, hold on, I coached with Christina Venega, who uh, used to be the head coach for Tom and is now Keller Williams. And I had Dale Snyder, who Keller went to Keller Williams, and uh, he's, I think, in Vegas. I had him for a bit. And now I have Tom. So, and I had, I had in between those, I had Tom each time for a bit. He's quite a bit more expensive than the regular coaches, correct? He's He is more expensive than the regular coaches. However, like, you can't hire him. He has to kind of hire you. Right. But he, for whatever reason, and there's, I, I can't really explain this, I, I love him, right? He has changed my life. However, like, I always want to do better, and I never, ever want to show up not having done my homework. Cause he's got that other side, like, and he causes me to, to work harder. I've made a, like a lot of shifts. Like when, if you asked him when he first got me, like, I didn't know anything at all. You couldn't, I used to carry a cheat sheet in my pocket all the time with my numbers, every single thing. Cause he loved to stand me up and ask me my numbers. And, and I was still like crushing it. Always way doing way better than all these, these guys with their spreadsheets and everything, just cause I'm a, I'm a good salesperson. Mm -hmm. Right. But at a certain point, if you don't know your numbers, right, you can't have a budget. If you don't have a budget, you could go out of business. So for me, like I learned that if I was going to grow, I had to run my business like a business. And also in growing a team, depending on having what, what's your exit strategy, right? I am not going to be a 90 year old woman throwing people in the back of my car. Cause I don't want to do that. Right. It's just, however, 
that leaves you with options, right? At this point, teams are more valuable than brokerages. And the big brokerages are buying teams, right, in order to grow. So, but that means that you have to have a functional team with real systems, right, that's tracked. And as well as you need to, I need to personally be only 15% of production. Otherwise, I am the team. So all of that, he's helped me get to a point of where I can break down every single thing for you. And I'm able to know if I'm not making money here, let's not spend money there. Just it's changed everything. So he's taken me, who's kind of a happy-go-lucky person, and made me into a business person, which um, is bizarre. So you can't snow time. Oh, my God. Because you, you said you, you all have gotten close. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. But you can't you snow know what it, No. You can't because he's very specific. <laughs> I don't lie. If you ask me a question, like you have also people that I, I never understand that say they're doing tons of stuff and they're not. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's all a crock of shit. But at this point, I, that, I just tell them the truth and then you can tell if I'm a slacker. Like, when there's a problem, I'm generally the problem. And I've learned, right? I'm not the best at everything. I like to think that I'm the best at everything, but the truth is, is like, I should never be the person doing your contract. And if you don't keep things in front of me like this, I can do anything. I'm coachable, right? You just have to keep redirecting me. If it's not on my schedule, I don't do it. For example... So my marketing department right now is, well, she's on her honeymoon, and she's a nice girl. We've probably outgrown her a little bit, or else, I I don't really know. Somebody else needs to be answering my Facebook, right? Because you saw, you said, and I didn't, right? Right. If she were here and not on her honeymoon, she would have responded to you, because I get so many messages, like my email. I get like 500 email, 1,000 email a day. If I have to look through that email, we're, we're going to fucking die. So I have somebody who goes through my email, right? Leaves me the five emails that I have to answer, answers everything else for me because it's not physically possible. I can't be making phone calls, responding to Facebook. I see all these people that are on Facebook all the time and I'm thinking they're obviously not making any money because if your whole life is on Facebook, it's, there's got to be happy mediums and you have to have systems in place and everything has to be on a schedule so that it happens. But that's not my forte. I'm not a digital marketer, right? I'm not a social media person. And I'm, I'm certainly not the person who's doing your contracts. I am the lat, like, there's a lot of things that I'm good at. And, you know, so I'm at a point now where as much as possible, if it doesn't make me money, I can't do it. So I am my own worst enemy, but my ops person is, uh, is just keeps bringing me back to where I'm supposed to be. Do you know what I mean? I'll come out. She's like, Oh, you're not supposed to be doing that. Go back in there. (laughs) Or all of those, those things that other people can do. You, You have to get there. You can't control everything. And that's, I think a lot of people get to a point and they're so controlling and they want to do everything. And there's some things, and I still, to this day, right, know that there are things that happen that could be better and that I could have done them better, but I I delegated them to other people. And that was a hard lesson to learn from Tom, where when I got to the point where 75% of the people love me and I do a great job, 25% of the people, well, we forgot them. They fell through the cracks. Things weren't that great. But you can't run a huge machine like this and have everybody love you. You do the best that you can and you try to correct whatever it is that, you know, that you didn't do well that time. But the four best, uh, or the best word in real estate is next. (laughs) Like, and I don't, listen, we do a good job. I absolutely 100% take pride in everything. And we never, ever let anything die. You're dying over a home inspection issue. Your freaking window needs to be changed. It's going to be $400. They don't want to pay for it. I send the contractor. That's the other thing. I am 100% full service. I own 
probably 20 units full of furniture at this point. And I have a mover and I have uh, a stager. All of these people work for me. I have the contractor, the plumber, every single thing. So we're never dropping the ball. When I go on an appointment, I'm like, I'll take a look at your house and I'll say, okay, we need some staging. So this is what I think we should do. I'm going to send Matt the packer over here. He's going to pack your stuff up and you just need a storage space. Here's the phone number. You give us the thing. We hang a combination lock. We're going to put your stuff in storage. And then my stager is going to come the next day. They're going to take out the furniture that's here that shouldn't be here. And we're going to change it out. And then you get to live that way until you make it through your home inspection. People like that, right? Especially what's going on now. They want full service. They don't want to have to do that. Is there They're, an added fee for your furniture and your so staging? I charge them for man with a van to move it, but I already own the furniture. It was an expense. Every market is different, but in my market, the really great realtors here are all doing somewhat what I'm doing. And the ones that aren't, that are commission cutting, I am getting my fee. I, I cannot negotiate. I will lose your listing. You know what I mean? Before I'm it's just not going to happen. We are full service and I lay it out for people. And most of the time we get the listing. So nine out of 10 times I get the listing. Like I don't want to be a stager. I don't want to do any of those things, but that's why my cost per transaction is so high. And I don't really know how to change that. I'll, I'll give you another interesting fact. My uh, a very good friend of mine who runs the other largest producing team here and um, who I talk to, you know, all the time, has a totally different business model than I do, does nothing, literally at all, doesn't spend anything, no overhead, and he's killing it. He stands in a room and he calls, and he calls, and he calls, and he calls, and he calls. And he's incredibly transactional, whereas I'm much more relationship-based, but he doesn't care because it's working for him. And he has people that he calls door openers. He has his buyer, his, like, two buyer's agents, and they speak to them on the phone, they do a, uh, you know, buyer, whatever, consultation in the office. They send them out with the door openers to look at the properties. They follow up when the people like them, and then they negotiate for them on the deal, right? Fascinating. And it's super interesting. It's why he's transactional, because I don't really see how you could really build serious rapport with people that way. But he is incredibly smart and successful and is on. Uh, so, and it's working for him. So your internet leads, are those more for your, your team members and you're more SOI based? I try to take as few buyers as possible. However, what ends up happening with me is if you have, uh, if you have a kid who needs a $1,200 rental in Hoboken and nobody will help them and you know me, you call me and I get stuck with them. Or if like, it's the same with open houses, I'll get the shittiest house that nobody can sell and they'll be doing the luxury properties. Like I try to go where I'm the floater, where I'm most needed. And uh, my internet leads, they get given out depending on who's here, who's prospecting. And so 33% of my business comes off of the internet. And then, you know, we have a pretty good system. If you're going to run a team, you have to have leads to give them. You have to get them to do other things besides that as much as possible. But the truth is, is that some of them don't. So, you know what I mean? They'll do whatever. Some of them are not so good on the phone. There are teams that do that better than me, but my return on those on the leads is pretty good. And uh, so there's no reason not to do that. However, I know that calling my past clients is, is pretty much free. And and I've been I do fairly well with that. And so, you know, it's the same thing they teach you when you come out of like real estate. Uh, school and you start and your broker says, okay, write down every single person that you know, right? Everyone. I'm not talking about just like the people you think you know and your relatives, but your dentist, your doctor, all the attorneys, blah, 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 blah. And then you're going to send them all a handwritten card and then you're going to call them on the phone and then you're going to tell them that you are a realtor because, and you're going to have to keep doing that because they won't remember, right? So starting there and you develop your sphere and we try to get them to start out in the beginning, so they actually have some sort of system in place. Because otherwise, you get to be like I was, right? Where you have 20,000 people in there, right? You have no idea who anyone is. And that's no fun, right? And that's because 
you know, back in the day, like, what's a CRM? If, if anyone else asks me, what CRM do you use? Any CRM. Who gives a shit? You just have to put them somewhere, you know, and have some sort of system in place so you can remember them. We also do mailings, right? And we have, it's, it's pretty unique here because you have people that farm, like the whole farming. And I guess I farm too because I send cards out every time I sell anything. And how many of those cards are going out? Every property, about 500 of them go out. And at different points, I also send out a market, you know, watch newsletter. So we do lots and lots of mailings. But I have found that because we're in such a small radius and because I always come up on Zillow and Julia, right, in, in the zip codes that I cover, so even if it's not my listing, it looks like it's my listing, I suck you in, that I don't know how much farming, it's hard to attribute where things come from. Right. Because I'll get people that have been watching me send them shit for five years. Now, who gets, who? where does that come from? Is it Zillow? Is it my signs? Is it, you know what I mean? So it's a little bit different than going into a new farm, right? And, and trying to take over which I am doing a little bit of that with these guys because I got to try to get them to the surrounding areas because there's no reason why we can't go, you know, five or six miles in each direction. And it's the other thing is, is that both Hoboken and like downtown Jersey City, which is where you are, the realtors are very savvy here, right? We have smart realtors. But if you drive five miles, the competition, they're lame. Like, and I could send my young people out there and they get listings. I mean, all I have to do is take the shit that we do in comparison with the nothing that they do over there. And it's, it's not that complicated. It gets harder right here in Hoboken because when I compete, I typically compete against, you know, one of the top 10 and there's nothing wrong with that. We all know each other. So your expansion, or you, you talked about the Jersey City expansion. It's one mile not, away from here. And not working out, like not. Well, so, so I, it's, it hasn't not worked out. I learned some lessons, so I have somebody else that I put there now. But are they? Is it all run here centrally and so out? Or are you this, planting no, no, people no. in an office? This is my hub here. Jersey City is more like a satellite office with uh, the ideal, I think, is, is seven um, of them. Currently, I think there are five of them. But there is a brick and mortar. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. They have a place to go. So, you know, people are doing away, right, with brick and mortar. Companies, what is your opinion on that? Just... So I understand it, but I couldn't run a team like that. I need them to show up physically here so I know what they're doing. Otherwise, they're not working. Right? Right. I can tell. I can't track what's wrong with you if I can't see it. And I know personally that I have to show up, right? I show up every single day in the morning, and I work every day, including Sunday. Sunday is my early day. I sometimes get home by 6. <laughs> Work-life balance, Right. And then when I'm fried, right, like about every six weeks, I hop on a plane and I transfer my phone calls to my lead agent and I don't talk to you for five days. And then I come back. I do things every five or six weeks that I check out. But other than that, I work. That's the other thing, right? People come and they join your team and they think they're going to study everything, right? If I had it to do over again, right, I would join a team. And I'd watch that team lead, and I'd listen to every single thing that was happening, and I would download every one of those systems. I had the person that you wouldn't want to have come, and um, and then I would, you know, copy everything. But that doesn't really happen, because they come here, and they watch me. Nobody wants to be me, right? Everybody wants to have a life. I made choices that have made me how I am. And I would not trade it because this is kind of how I'm wired and, and what I what I do. But, you know, my kids are different people because, I mean, that's how they are. And not in a bad thing. Like, I, my kids, I think, college graduation. And she said, hey, mom, if you text somebody during it and I see you, that's it. So everything, even when they were smaller, has been on my, on my calendar. Like, I, I told them. I don't know. Spring break. I said, okay, I'm going to pull it together. I'll take you guys to Mexico. I took him for one day to Philly and we had cheese dates. I <laughs> so like my, it doesn't mean like I took him to the South of France in the summer and I pulled him out of school and taken him to zip lining in Costa Rica. And so our, we have had a lot of unconventional, but if I have something else that pops up, people, nobody wants to hear that you're not 
Like you, you can't take their listing and then just not speak to them. So, you know, I have good people to cover for me, but I really am committed, right? Tom says that interested or committed commitment. You know, there's not that many committed people. I mean, how many people do you think work that much? Well, I was telling Travis before we got here, you and I have not had the chance to, to, to meet really personally, but I've been in the room with you. Like I've been around you and, you know, whatever event we're at, you are like this on your phone or during a break or, you know, if something, you know, whenever somebody stops speaking and it's, you're, you're like this returning calls are on the phone. So it's like, there's, there's a lot of that. So it's not, it's not that glamorous, right? You can't really train people to do that. The only people that are like that are like, they kind of come out that way. I think. I, I want to imagine this floater situation is humbling for the rest of your team to witness that. Like, Jill will go take the shitty open house. Mm -hmm. Jill will take the renter, you know. Well, it was really, listen, I have, I used to, if you were the, well, first of all, if you do an open house with me, I give you all the leads. It doesn't even matter what the price point is. Like I don't, and if it's too high of a price point, like I, I've been doing uh, some super high end shit now, I will partner with you so that you get paid. Like I'll show up because that's a learning experience for them. But I've also, like, if something sells at the open house and I happen to be there, I give you half the money. Like, I've been so nice to everybody that it has built me a lot of loyalty. But i got to change some of that shit. Because <laughs> otherwise, it's like, I'm very profitable. So it's not like I can't really complain and say that I'm, I'm suffering. But, you know, I'm trying to, to make this into a business that is at some point saleable. So you're a workaholic, but you don't want to be the 90-year-old woman showing buyers. How so are you going to work this out? Ready? I'm not going to retire. I, I would never want to retire. What, what the heck would I do? And I don't even know. Like, I come up with plans. My plans evolve depending on what's going on in the market, what I'm interested in. Um, I tend to surround myself with other people that run these big teams. And so I guess... If I sell my team, and I don't know that I have to sell the whole team, I could sell half of the team. And, and it depends on what my kid, right, and what my group wants to do as well. Because the other thing that I started doing is, is buying investment properties, mm -hmm. right? And there's no reason why I can't be the developer. Like, the, like I'm mm -hmm. interested in all different kinds right. of things. So... You know, I got, I'm working on getting passive income and I actually do like, uh, helping people. I actually, I would, the coaching thing is, uh, I already coach all of them, but that's, I, all of that stuff I find it, it makes you feel good to help people. I love to fly around and I do it for my company and, and help people grow and, and fix, you know, I mean, a lot of the things are, are pretty easy. It's easy to look at a different team at what they're doing and see holes and where they could fix things, you know, so that's interesting. Yeah, I could see you being a coach. I could. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, but I could never do it. It's not a, like a, whatever they I They probably do, would need thick skin. You could have a thin skin client maybe, or they would need to be able to thicken the skin up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not for the faint of heart. Right. <laughs> Well, that wraps up another Agent 2501 podcast. Thanks so much for listening. You can find our show on iTunes, uh, any place you get your podcast fix. We really appreciate the listening, and please share it with your friends. This show has been paid for and powered by JWRE, Jason Will Real Estate. You can find Jason, Diana, and the whole JWRE team on the Internet and Facebook. And uh, everybody, have a great and productive and happy weekend.